Okay, so we all remember this. I certainly do. It's actually, believe it or not, even though it's black or white, this looked like my elementary and high school experiences, quite honestly. Um, and in fact, usually the desks were a little bigger, but it kind of looked like college for me too, right? Um, I did not, I did not have email in college. I did not have any kind of mobile device in college. And it is completely different. In fact, this is really now what school is looking like for a lot of, a lot of college students, right? Much of what's happening in higher education is no longer in the classroom, in desks, in lecture. Much of the learning that's happening in higher education on purpose is outside of the classroom. And a lot of that is because higher education is, 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 is being forced to innovate, right? There's lots of legislation that's forcing higher education to innovate, but then also students are really demanding that innovation. Students are saying, I don't, I don't wanna learn this way anymore. I'm not interested in that, I'm bored. I'm gonna sit, it used to be the kids, you always knew who didn't pay attention because they opened the paper in the back row, now it's everybody's on their mobile device, right? And they don't want that. They actually want this, they're asking for this. And in fact, if we think about one of the biggest changes that's facing us, it's our students are different. They interact differently, they're a different generation, and because of that, we need to find the best ways to help them learn the most effectively. And also, Jobs are changing. We have to do different things in the workplaces. And it's higher education's commitment to making sure that we're producing children that can be effective, that can contribute, and that can find rewarding careers. So the questions that we're gonna address today are three. One, how is higher education changing? Two, what are the kinds of things, and particularly open things, or free things that are out there that are making this change? And then three, what are some things that you guys can do? All right, so we've got four forces of change. The first one I've already alluded to, it's students. Our kids are totally different when they're hitting high school. You guys have probably all heard about the millennial generation. The, you know, there's all sorts of different names for it, Generation Y, you hear all sorts of names. But basically, it's, it's, there's been quite a bit of science that students currently aged about like five or six through to 23 have different um, drivers, different motivations, different ways they want to interact with people, mm -hmm. different ways they want to learn than generations before. And now they're starting to research the really young ones and saying, are they the same or are they different? But this, this big gap, and it actually, it's funny because I always thought of the millennial generation only being like 10 years. It seems like it'd be short, generation would be 10 years. It's actually a 20 year gap where the students are really different. The kids are really different. In fact, they want to be social. The research has proven that. There's, it's the way they just naturally interact and have evolved. They want to be community-minded. They actually want to be able to contribute and know how they're going to contribute. They're multitaskers, mega multitaskers. We see this all the time. Four devices at once, <laughs> you know, or they're doing, they're talking and having three conversations. But that's how, they, that's how they've been evolved to interact because of technology. Um, and they are less interested in theory or theoretical ideas, and they're way more interested in the real world application of those ideas. It's, they often are called the me generation. How does it affect me? How does it, why, why do I need to know this? And they are hesitant to speak their minds. So they won't even participate. Students, some students aren't even engaging in college, even though they could or they're smart enough to, they, they have the desire, their families encourage them because they don't understand what's in it for them they see going and having a practical career or something like that as more valuable. And I don't mean that in a bad way. You know, like I said, the me generation, they're, they want to be community minded. They want to contribute. So it's, it's not so much selfish as it is, they just need to have, understand how it relates to them. So higher education knows that. They know that in US News and World Report, things get ranked, schools, colleges get ranked on how tech savvy are you? How tech cool are you? You know, they go and visit and they look around on the campuses and want to see how is technology being used? How are teachers teaching me? So they know, the, the millennial generation knows to be wise shoppers and higher education knows, well, if we need these students to come to our institutions, we need to serve them. Meanwhile, we have a lot less money in higher education. A lot less money. Um, a lot less federal money and then a lot less state money for all sorts of various reasons. In California, there's you know a whole host of legislation and then property tax, all sorts of things that, that cause that. 
but at the end of the day, it's less money. But at the same time, students are taking longer to finish because they're having to work part-time because not only do colleges have less money and universities, but students have less money too. But also, degrees are getting more expensive. In fact, they're getting more expensive pretty significantly. So we've got this sort of interesting space where less money to institutions, more expensive degrees, students have less money, but then it takes them time longer to finish. It's sort of creating this endless cycle around how can we be most efficient with what we're teaching and learning and how we're, how we're students in an environment where we have to do less with more. And sometimes less with more is using technologies in really effective ways. So higher education is addressing that. And then the final, um, the final driver of change in higher ed right now is there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of unique competition. So there's the for-profits. We've all heard of the University of Phoenix and that kind of thing. And those are great institutions. They tend to be degree completion programs and not as much the traditional college or university experience. But they're competition to UC Irvine and UCLA and Cal State San Marcos and you know, all of the schools around here, Orange Coast College, they're all, they're all competition. And they're forcing um, traditional universities to be much more competitive. There's also a whole bunch of stuff online. You can pretty much get any degree you want online, some of which you can even do for free or really, really cheap. And if this millennial generation is questioning what's in it for me, they have to work anyway because they don't have enough money to do a traditional college degree. And these, these degrees, these online degrees, are giving them the same kind of value to go be successful in their workplace, they're gonna choose that. So the traditional university, the colleges up and down the street, they're really faced with these changes and they have to change. And so they're using technology to do that. It's not necessarily the driver in their teaching, but they're capitalizing on technology to be able to bring out some of the best ways to teach and to offer opportunities for kids in college. So, I like to call the higher education call to action, the things that we're doing actually in higher education to address these challenges. First and foremost, as you can see here, we're looking at new ways to teach. And actually, it was really interesting. I worked with the Huntington Beach High School District just two weeks ago. When they had a big technology fair and invited me to come speak. And the teachers were saying, can you tell me how I can make my classes more interesting or more engaging? Can you tell me how I can better prepare students for college? And so we talked a lot about these two models, the hybrid and the flip model. Has anybody heard of hybrid or flipped? Have you guys heard about this? Probably not, okay. A little bit, okay, awesome. So hybrid is where you take half of, half or not even half, it could be any portion of a normal class and put it online. And then the rest of the class they meet face to face. So hybrid is, you don't see it as much in the high schools yet, although I think it's coming, but it's definitely in the college space. So students, and we're gonna talk about what this means on the skills that kids need for when they go to college. But know that hybrid means half online or some portion online, some portion in a normal face-to-face -face setting. Now something that often gets confused with is also this flipped phrase. So if you're reading in the newspaper that a district is flipping their classroom, you're thinking, what does flipping my classroom mean? Um, flipping means they're taking out all those boring lectures. They're asking students to do that at night. And in the class, they're doing very hands-on, action-oriented, problem-solving, challenges, projects. They're, what they're doing is they're taking the homework that kids used to do at home, and they're putting it in the classroom. And they're taking the boring lectures out. They're replacing them with other materials, sometimes lectures, recorded lectures, but sometimes other kinds of interesting materials, and then actually hands-on with the kids in the class. And it was really interesting when I was working with these high school students in, at Huntington Beach High School, they had some students sharing about what they really liked about their teachers today. It was a very open-ended question. They said they want their teachers to be the ones to help them when they get stuck in problems. They don't want the teachers to be the one imparting knowledge anymore. They want to be able to go find knowledge. In fact, they're already finding knowledge. They need help figuring out how to apply that knowledge and helping them when they get stuck. So that's the hybrid and flip space. Colleges are all over this. At UCI, the flip classroom is it's, it's the trend, and you're gonna see it, it's interesting, it's happening the most in the sciences. 
which is great, right? Very hands-on courses. Um, and it's really, the students are really appealing, they're really appreciating it and really finding themselves learning more in these hybrid settings. So you're gonna see more and more and more of that. Preparing students for that is different. So thinking about that, while also thinking about higher education knows they've gotta use mobile devices. Students don't read their emails anymore. We know it. It's so funny, I still read my email and you know, I'm thinking, oh, email, so this is the way I, everybody gets in touch with me. No, well, they get in touch with me through Facebook and Twitter and every other social media platform. And while higher education, of course, doesn't want to mix the personal, right, with the academic, and there needs to be an understanding for academics, they also know that's where the kids are. And they need to be able to use those tools really effectively to help teach the kids. So you're gonna see a lot more mobile devices. They're also ubiquitous. You know, students have some sort of device by the time they get to university. So we know we can get them and we can help them learn and, 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 and expose themselves to materials through those devices. There's also this whole new world of open resources. It's been around for 10 years or so, but it's really emerging. And it's evolved itself into, we'll talk a little bit about MOOCs in a minute. It's evolved itself into all these kind of crazy online courses and free resources and things that students have access to. And universities are capitalizing on that. Because think about, um, I'll use Saddleback as an example. Saddleback College. They may not have the world-renowned chemistry faculty, but at UCI, we have the number two ranked chemistry department. And they put all of their first and second year video lectures online for free. Well now Saddleback can utilize some of those video lectures, bits and pieces of them, to help bring some of that renowned chemistry experience and then flip their classes and then have their teachers work with students through chemistry problems and activities. So you're gonna see a lot more of this use of other people's resources. And these resources are great because they're out there for anybody. So students, high school kids, junior high, all ages can use these too to learn things. Khan Academy, people have heard of the Khan Academy, right? That's a famous, famous online free resource. We're also seeing alternative programs emerge. Um, it's just starting to hit, but competency-based programs. They're coming out of University of Washington, University of Wisconsin, Georgia Tech. These are where you work with a coach. You, you pay, you do a year or two years, you work with a coach, a mentor, no teachers, and you go off and you create learning opportunities for yourself. So maybe you do an internship, maybe you do then write a paper, an investigation, or create a project around a topic, and these coaches are just coaching you and helping you get access to the resources but they're not, there's no actual teachers. These competency-based programs are just starting to emerge. I'm not sure how much they'll stick widespread, but they're out there. And there's a lot of students, and even non-traditional students, the, you see a lot around the like 21, 22, 23, I didn't go to college, but I know I need to, but now I'm in a job and it's too late to go back full time. Students getting into some of the competency-based stuff. And then there's also flexible scheduling. Um, this online aspect of it is what uh, the colleges and universities are doing. They're creating different ways for students to take classes at different times of day. So once again, they can be involved in all these other things that the millennial generation wants to. Now the final thing that colleges um, are really getting into is K-12 preparedness. So you guys might be familiar with Common Core. It's now implemented or it's in the process of being implemented. California is implementing it right now. My husband teaches high school. He's in the process of it. Um, Common Core is now mandating experiences for high school students. Actually, it's for all ages. It mostly impacts though high school in that these experiences need to be cross-discipline. So it's about bringing together four different disciplines. It's not about teaching in your own silo. I just teach math. No, it's teaching writing in math. It's teaching um, uh, physics in math. It's teaching a language in math. It's, it's, it's bringing this broader approach to learning. Well, that's impacting colleges because on the one hand, great, that's preparing them for this row-rounded experience. On the other hand, it's gonna take teachers a while to do that. And actually, colleges are kind of expecting the achievement gap to go down a little bit for a while because now teachers are having to convert their classes and their curriculum and all of this stuff to adapt to this common core. So colleges are stepping in and universities and saying, hey, we better do some programs. We better offer some stuff. UC Irvine offers five free, not free, sorry, very low cost classes over the summer 
to prepare students for their entry-level college courses, like a, a pre-bio, a pre-chemistry, a pre-calculus uh, class. These are all online courses to help prepare kids to bridge them so that they can get into, so that when they get into college, they're more effective. So you're going to see colleges and universities doing all of this stuff. Lots of stuff going on. But what does this actually really mean for you all as parents, grandparents, friends of kids, and so forth? Well, what it means is there's a whole lot of stuff out there for you to tap into, and then some things that you can do with your kids, with your friends' kids, with your grandkids, that you can help them be better prepared for college. So the first set here is, and I'll make sure that this presentation is shared so you can share it with, with everybody so you can get the links to these actual sites. But there's a couple of different sites, and I'm making some examples here, of free online games, free online videos and resources and quizzes and all sorts of tools that you can send kids to to go get good, discipline, specific, vetted, well-known content. And these, like I said, are awesome sites. And then you also have MOOCs. Have, ever been, have you guys all heard of MOOCs? It's been in the press? No? All right. Usually, you know, it's funny. It's, it's not as ubiquitous yet as the press makes it seem. So MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Actually, these are Coursera, Canvas, edX. Those are all companies that offer these MOOCs. They are free courses. They'll have a duration of time. And <coughs> you, students go in, they watch videos, they do quizzes, they work on peer assignments, and they can even discuss with one another in their discussion forums and environments. So UCI, is t we've taught, the movement came out about a year ago. And since then, we've, we've taught 13, I'm actually teaching one right now <laughs> on emerging trends and technologies in K-12. But we've taught 13 of them, and it's really interesting. Tons of homeschool kids. We taught algebra, pre-calculus. We also saw a lot of kids taking these courses when they're bridging the end of their high school experience into college. Or because they know if they're coming back to school after a couple years, because they know they haven't been in school and they might not remember some of those concepts, they're taking these free online courses. You may have heard, so UC Irvine, we're, we're experimenting with um, a, a MOOC focused on The Walking Dead. <laughs> so it's the major themes from the television show The Walking Dead, and it's academic, it's public health, social sciences, math, and physics. And we're hopeful that students just come in it and take a one week of interest in this course and maybe get inspired that they want to be in physics or in math or want to learn more about health sciences. So you're going to see more and more of those kinds of experiments. And once again, all of this is out there for you to tap into. And the links that I have here, so when you get the PowerPoint, they point to great uh, aggregators or full lists that are well-known, well-vetted in education. So you can use those to then go and check out everything that's there. So what does this mean for how your students need to learn how to learn? Well, so in talking to my husband, he comes home and he's exhausted a lot. He's like, I can't believe they, the kids can't do this. And then in talking to a lot of teachers, um, there is a skill set that needs to be honed in order to be even successful in high school and then definitely in college. And I don't think, I know I wouldn't have thought necessarily this is what I need to be doing with my son or daughter because I, I learned very differently. I figure they need to learn how to listen for an hour and a half to somebody really boring and read three textbooks. But no, they actually need to learn some very different skills. And these skills, although they seem like, oh yeah, that makes sense, they aren't, a lot of kids aren't coming, especially into high school and definitely into college with these skills. So being able to learn independently. One of the, the things I chatted with the high school teachers that I was helping was you gotta give students a chance to own the learning and to fail. Because when they get to college, and they, I should say, they will be guaranteed they will take an online course at some point in their college career. Michigan has actually gone so far as requiring all students by the time they graduate high school, they have to at least take in one online course. Because they want to make sure kids are prepared when they go to college. Everybody, UCI is expecting 10% of our course offerings in the next couple of years will be online. California, the legislature mandated it. We have to be having online courses. And you're seeing like the Cal States do even more than that, 20, 30% in order to deal with the high number of students and all those other issues, the funding challenges and stuff. The challenge with, with online learning 
is it's often very independent. You have to remind yourself to go log in. You have to go participate. You own the learning. You don't have a teacher checking in on you every single day asking you, have you done this part of the project? How far are you? Can I help you? And I think as parents, many parents want to help students. They want to help them get through the projects. But then it doesn't teach them to necessarily be independent learners and to fail. Because a very high portion of students, the first online course they take, they fail. Because of this. Because they don't know how to be independent learners and the second one because they don't know how to manage their time. All of a sudden they have 10 things to do and it's two days left before the end of the class and they're scrambling to get it done and they haven't learned that because they haven't progressed through the course as they should have. Um, technology management, helping students understand, and, and I have information literacy as the fourth, helping students understand how to use technologies academically because they're there and then how to be able to vet content. You know, students Google things and then the, whatever's at the top must be the right answer, right? That's not necessarily the resource or the right answer. And understanding how to work through that material and be literate and be able to make wise decisions about the research that you find online is really, really important and not quite often addressed. And then finally, being able to have students communicate online. Totally different than communicating in person, we know that. And different than how you communicate personally. <coughs> How do you collaborate online? How do you communicate with other people online? Helping them understand what those skills are. What's tone in email? You know, why you need to capitalize things. Those kinds of things that are different than how they use technology personally are really important because once again, if they're not taking an online course, guaranteed they're taking a flip course and most likely they're taking a blended course, all of which will require communication and collaboration online. This last one's my favorite. Because they're multitaskers, they have focus of like five minutes. Actually, there's research. There's research that says that starting at age, I think it's age five, you have three minute, three minute focus at age five, and then it goes up every year one, one minute, and it like maxes out at 20. And there's actually a fair amount of research on this. So about 20, 22 minutes is our max. Well, the challenge of taking online courses or being in higher education, being independent learners, having to do all of this on your own, is that you actually need to be able to focus on something more than 20 minutes. Now higher education is trying to help. We're chunking videos into little five minute pieces and we're then having them go to an activity or a self check quiz question. So we're trying to help with this, but they still need to know how to be able to focus or have time on task for more than 20 minutes ideally. Now there's also life skills. And this is a little bit, not as related to technology, but things that believe it or not, we see students missing. And the teachers at UCI, the teachers that I work with through Pepperdine, all tell me that this has changed significantly in the last five years. You know, it's like students are, they're coming more stressed. I was chatting with one of the students at Huntington Beach and this student was telling me, I feel like every decision I made from the day I came in my freshman year was about getting to college. And she's like, and I'm not going to Harvard. I'm going to Cal State San Marcos. It's not Harvard, it's a great school, but it's not Harvard. And I still feel like every decision I've made is about that. That's four years of stress, just to make sure you get into a college and you're prepared for a college. And then they come to college and they, have, they like unwind. They have no idea, it's like they unravel. We're starting to mandate at UCI and a lot of universities and colleges are doing this, stress management, health nutrition, and money management courses. We're gonna do all one unit courses, they get a free unit, it's a pass-fail, but they're at least exposed to how can I now manage myself outside of a um, either um, very managed household or sometimes very unmanaged household. Either way, they've not had any of these sort of experiences at home and college doesn't, I mean in high school, they're not having time to do this. They're just helping them get into college or go to the job that they want to do. Um, sleep, of course, uh, and leadership. To get into college, you need to express leadership. And once you're in college, because you will guarantee in every class have a group project, almost every class. I would say 75% of your classes, 75 to 80% of your classes, you will have to do a group project. And there's gonna be times when you need to lead them, and then there's gonna be any times when as a student, you're gonna need to know how to be a participant, but respond to a leader. And so helping students have opportunities to expose to that and then all of the social skills that come with that. 
it's interesting to hear students talk about their college experiences and how different they are over those years. And I think that's all I, I went to school with very little, I'm sure, social skills. I am sure. Um, I, was a, I was a nerd. But it's different now because so much of what we do requires those social skills and those, those interaction skills um, because it's online, because of the way technology is evolving, that it's important for them to know that earlier and be more prepared for that when they come to college. Now, what can you do as parents? This is my last slide. And then we'll open up to questions. Encourage your students to go and do things like internship programs, work-life experiences. Put them in situations where they have to take some knowledge and then apply it to a real-world new situation. It's higher order thinking skills. Get them to apply what they're doing. And have, a, have them do it in, a, in an environment where they have some responsibility, some personal responsibility. You can do that even through volunteer work, community service, giving them outlets to, to feed the kind of generation they are, while at the same time helping them with those social skills, leadership skills, and applying knowledge skills. You can do that through school clubs, and then encouraging, I'd like to call them creative, you know, the right brain activities, because students will also be called upon much less to answer multiple choice tests multiple choice questions and much more to design something um, there's if you guys have, have never heard of it, it's called Bloom's taxonomy it's got orders orders of thinking of skills right and and at the very bottom it's rote memorization and this is a real rough summary of this and at the very top it's these higher order thinking skills it's the ability to create something new well colleges and universities want to get to that top and so they're going to provide as many opportunities particularly in upper division stuff where students are creating things new if you've never created anything new, it's very stressful. <laughs> and a lot of times high schools don't have them create anything new. And so helping them have projects at home that can help them create something new is really helpful. Open-ended problems, great example of have them solve something. Have them go, like I, I joke around, but you have something broken at home. Well, have them go research how to fix it. Have them make suggestions for how to fix it. As long as it's not dangerous, have them maybe try to fix it. And then help them and coach them on that. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of giving them opportunities to go do these activities where they have ownership. Competitive sports activities, though that's a classic one. I think we all have, I, even I was raised with making sure you did that. But then, oops, didn't mean to do that. But then also thinking about strategy activities or ways, once again, to apply collective knowledge. I mean, you can do games. You know, this is this could be online games, right? But this isn't first-person shooters. Unfortunately, this is not Call of Duty. Um, this is, though, uh, strategy games that are very popular. Like, there's a game called um, Lord of Ultima. There's a Warcraft game. There's some other games that require strategy and oftentimes team-based things. So if you've got a, a son, daughter, granddaughter that's interested in gaming, you can channel their energies that way and finding the right kinds of games for them to participate in. And it's getting technology involved and it's helping engage them and they're having no apply learning. So these are just some of the kinds of things, the fun things you can do on the weekends, the fun things you can do with kids, grandkids, friends, kids, to get them prepared or to get them back in developing those skills that colleges and universities are really gonna demand. Anybody have any questions, wanna know more information? Thank you.